So the moral of that story is if you want or need prayer, uh, there's just no excuse not to get it. We've got lots of ways to pray for you. Good morning. Uh, my name's Kevin. I'm the senior pastor here and one of the elders. So happy uh, to, to be with you. Uh, and again, just reiterating what Daryl said. If you're new, I'd love to meet you. I usually hang out over here and try to capture, knock down, shake hands with anybody that I've not met yet. Would love to say hello to you uh, and introduce uh, myself and uh, offer you a gift. Uh, of course, we've got the the uh, Village Coffee Mugs, uh, which are always popular. But everyone, uh, last week we, we talked about it being the, uh, uh, the, the hat trick of services last week. We started a new series. Um, we also um, have t-shirts uh, for everybody. We, had, we shared a meal together. Uh, but if you didn't get one, there are still plenty of t-shirts down there. Uh, so uh, I, I remember I, I, I was talking about, I love, you know, we, the, the Israelites would use uh, piles of stone as marks and memories, landmarks to kind of refresh in their memory at significant times. That's our version of that is t-shirts. We like to use, give away t-shirts for these times throughout the ministry of the church. Uh, and I, I joked about loving seeing these t-shirts, especially the ones we've had throughout the years, uh, it, which includes seeing our t-shirts around town. Sometimes some of the homeless guys around town will be wearing our t-shirts. And so while we joked about it, I was sincere. I wasn't uh, taking, making light of it. Uh, I, we get home <laughs> on Sunday afternoon Nona uh, shows me on a Facebook feed on the uh, Facebook feed on the local South Lebanon page. She said, "Oh no, look at this!" And somebody had posted on there, "Hey, be careful! Saw this guy walking around my house. Uh, a little suspicious. Keep an eye out for him." I don't know who it was because it was kind of a blurry picture. But if you expanded it, you could see just enough to say that he had a village T-shirt on. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's a double-sided <laughs> coin, right? It's a a little bit dangerous, although uh, I've not gotten a call from anybody asking me to identify the person, so as far as I know, uh, we don't know who it is, but uh, uh, anyway, uh, please wear a t-shirt, and don't be a creep. Don't, don't be stalking people's houses. <laughs> if you're going to do that, wear somebody else's t-shirt, all right? So, <laughs> uh, well, speaking of which, we're, uh, we're in the second week of that new series, a series that uh, I, I have been talking about now for several weeks, which I think is a... Uh, uh, it's, it's marking a significant time in the, uh, the life of our church. I think it comes at a time both culturally and with where we are as a, as a group um, that it's very important. And, and we're, we're calling this series One Anothering. And uh, it's a, while a, it's a little bit of a clunky name, I, I think I'm hoping it's clear that the idea behind this series is we're going to look at, I mentioned last week, the 100 times the Greek word for one anothering was mentioned in the New Testament by people, of course, like Jesus, by James, by John, by Peter, by the writer of Hebrews, uh, that we see this term, which means one anothering or each other, that there are these directives, or what we looked at last week when Jesus said that a new command I give to you. So if you're wearing the t-shirt today, it says living a new command, and that command was to love one another. And I said to you that I think this commandment from Jesus is the, it's the hub in the middle of the spokes of the wheel of one anothering that all of the other one anotherings we're going to talk about for these next few weeks attach themselves to that hub that is the central message in this new way, which we know love wasn't new, but what, what we decided and what we talked about last week is it was a new command because we see in the person of Jesus a demonstrative example of the kind of New Testament love that we, the church, are called to do and to be and that we're to express that love to each other, to one another. And so we're going to, we're going to challenge ourselves, encourage each other, which, by the way, is one of the things that we're going to talk about, and we're going to look to the Scriptures to give us directions about our relationships and, frankly, about the mission of the church. And, and here's one of the dangers I'm always careful about. It's a bit of a peeve of mine that as we think about preaching within the local church that there are different ways to present the message of the scriptures. And uh, on occasion, we'll use a, a more expository method where we'll, we'll take a chapter or we'll take a book of the Bible and we'll go chapter by chapter, not usually verse by verse. That's typically our method at 930 in our Bible study. But we'll go chapter by chapter and we'll, we'll draw out the truth of the scriptures. And then sometimes we'll do like we're doing right now, which are these topical series. And so we'll look at a general topic and we'll go to the scriptures and say, what is the scripture saying about it? And in this topic, especially, I think there could be a danger if we're not careful 
that if we don't go into the deeper side of the pool, that we, if we survive and kind of live on the shallow end of the topic, that it really could be no different than what you would see on an Oprah episode, right? We just talk about relationships and the, hey, be a better dad, or be a better neighbor, or be a better friend. Those are all good things, right? I just don't think they're deep enough. That's why the scriptures are so instructive and important to us as we look at these broader relational topics because in the scripture we see and we hear from the architect we hear from the designer so as we deal with these heavier weightier topics of relationships and frankly again the mission of the local church that it's the scripture that reveals to us the source of God's heart and intent and this ancient truth that is so relevant today. And so what I mean by I don't want this to be an Oprah series is I want to take into context the time and the contemporary issues that are happening in our world today, but there's nothing new under the sun, right? Human nature being what it is, we just find new and creative way to express the same old problems. And so I want the scriptures to speak to us about these deeper topics. And so I want to make sure that you know that my intent is to use the scriptures as a catalyst and an anchoring to talk about these topics because I believe there's something very missional and very deep about what we're going to continue to talk about. Now today's topic, today's one anothering, uh, is, is one of those that may seem obvious on the surface, and I think it will be. And I also think that it's in, incredibly important to be talking about today because of the time we live in. Because of the current state of affairs and the culture that we're having. Remember, I talked a couple of weeks ago about spiritual warfare, and I shared in Ephesians 2 how the Apostle Paul talked about what I've come to call the three enemies of our soul, where he talks about the ways of this world, the Satan himself, and our flesh. And so representatively, as we talk about the sources of evil, we see it expressed that way, and one of them is the ways of this world, what I would call the culture. And so as I look at the contemporary culture, the culture that most of us are living in, the Western American culture, I think it's very difficult to look at our current state of affairs and not agree that we live in a very divisive and unsettled time. That in the history of American culture, that there are times when we were more divided. I know it feels bad now, but remember, we had a civil war not too long ago where we actually killed each other in mass numbers over disagreement. We've not reached that level of disunity yet, but we are in a stage and a place of disunity. We are in a place where we've normalized meanness, that we've just come to accept that that's how human beings are, and for whatever reason, we've just accepted it's okay to be that way to each other. And what's interesting is I was preparing, I'd already planned for this to be the first spoke in the wheel that we would talk about. That uh, this week, if you follow the, the news, uh, there was a, a whistleblower for Facebook that had, uh, has come out. I think she had worked for Google at some point and Pinterest and one of the other social media companies. She's a data expert. She understands with the term of algorithms and how these companies get us to view and take in their product. And she brought not just the news. What she said to us wasn't new, Right. But what she has is a lot of evidence and a lot of experience and revealed to us that Facebook and Instagram, that its model of business, its way to keep you and I attached, maybe addicted, or at the minimum watching a lot, is they have found a way to monetize division. Their money is made on the fact that we pay attention and we pay attention because their algorithms are built in such a way that the more negative, the more interactive, The more I find things that reinforce for me to think the way I'm already thinking, the more it shows up on my news feed, and that more that news feed is there and liked or shared or whatever, it becomes more prominent. And so the effect of that, if you don't know this already, this might be news to you, is you continue to get from things things from them that you want to see, and generally human nature is, is we tend to be more interactive towards the negative. We're we're much more engaging of of the meaner spirited things that we may not be willing to spend as much time talking about the good news. And so the nature of social media, and frankly, the way people just act on it, is mean and divisive. And so we've just come to know and expect that we've normalized this very unkind way that the world works. 
Now, just a little bit of a sidebar here. I think it was ironic that that person was brought in front of Congress, right? And so if you think about the division and disunity that goes in our country, the idea that Congress would be calling social media to task for its divisive habits is a little bit ironic and, frankly, I think a little hypocritical, right? If you think about the two major sources of division, those who benefit the most from division, those who benefit most from the tribalism and the otherness, what I would call the demonization of others, it is politics and it is media. And so as I was watching it on C-SPAN, I'm going, this is just a little bit interesting to me that if these two are having the conversation with each other and they're both guilty of the same thing. So before I share with you today about the one anothering, I, I want to acknowledge that we live in a time where we've normalized this division, and I want to remind us about the spiritual battle that wages around us, because later in Ephesians in chapter 6, the Apostle Paul tells us that the battle's not flesh and blood. You and I are not the problem. Everything about our politics and our media, or a lot of things about our politics, is not about bringing us together. It's about reinforcing the uniqueness of how we see ourselves and seeing as somebody that is different from me is the problem or the demon. And so we've just come to accept that that's the way it is. And now we write songs that say, why do you got to be so mean, <laughs> right? So before I talk about today's one another, I just want to establish the problem. And that is we live in a mean and unkind world. We, we live in a place where selfishness, self-centeredness, and my entitlement to talk to you about it is normalized, and so you've probably guessed by now that the antidote to that, today's one anothering, comes from the Apostle Paul himself in the book of Ephesians in chapter 4, verse 32, where Paul says this. He says, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. T today's one anothering is our call, our directive to be kind. <laughs> And to be compassionate, and I know it's probably not that revealing, right, that this is an expectation that it's the followers of Jesus, but I think it's important enough for Paul to include this in his instructions to us that we need to spend some time talking about it. And there's a lot of reasons why I started with this as our first spoke, the one anothering, but I'll just be honest with you, much of it is very personal. In, in my salvation journey, in my sanctification journey, Kindness was the spark that lit the flame of my relationship with God. In, in my mid and late 20s, I had been raised in church. I'd walked away from faith. I had, I had seen those who had a different way of seeing God and seeing the world as the problem. I was certain because of 20, I knew everything, right? I was certain that I had it all figured out. And so in that place in my late 20s, no, no, I began to have a family, and we moved into Springdale on Chesterdale Road. And when we lived on Chesterdale Road, just down the street from a new church that had just started a couple years ago, before that, called The Vineyard at the corner of Chesterdale and Crescent Springs. And many of you I know The Vineyard. I went on, actually, to be on staff there as a, a trustee for, for many years, a church that we have deep and loving affection with still today. But at that time, I was a fairly new father living in my first home, cynical, sarcastic, judgmental. And if I lived in that area, just a street down from this church, I kept running into these weird people that just were nice. <laughs> these kind people, I'd pull up to the stop sign and they would put a Coke or a Diet Coke through the window. And I'd be like, cool, I'll take Diet, that's my favorite, thank you. And inside of it was a little tab that says, hey, God's love is free, so is this soda. Or actually, it didn't say that, we're Cincinnati, so is this pop, right? <laughs> And every time I would go somewhere on different days, I kept running into these nice people, these kind people, and what I kind of came to find out later, that that was an intentional act of kindness. That it was their focus, their sustainable mission, their tactic to bring the kingdom of God to do these very simple acts of kindness, because it would affect people like me, who were at that time in my walk with the, with the world, was seeing God as something not relevant, and frankly, something I needed to reject, but it was kindness to begin to soften this very hard heart that I had actually developed over time. And it was not long after that, we were, Nona and I had a date night, and we were at, you guys remember Children's Palace there in Springdale? We went Christmas shopping. Allie was just a baby at the time. As we went through the line, 
at the end of that line, these weird, nice people were there and offered to wrap a gift for me. So we let them wrap the gifts, and I would get my Pollock. I pulled out the cash. I was ready to pay them. And then the whole time I'm going, what a great marketing idea. These guys really get how to grow a church. I'm really impressed with the idea that they would be this creative. And, of course, I tried to give them a donation, and they refused, which then made me angry because I don't want anything for free. I'm going to pay my way. I know, that this, I know that this wrapping paper cost you something, and I know your time is important, and you've told me you're from a church, and a church has bills, so I'm going to pay my part of it. They refused. And they said to me once again, God's love is free, and so is this. And so in my journey, and I look back now, some 25 years later, and I see just how much those regular and repeated acts of kindness were tearing down the division in my heart between me and God and, frankly, me and the church. And so as I talk about kindness this morning, I, I want you to know that this is more than me calling us to a place of just being nice people. But this is a missional activity of the local church, expressing itself in many ways. And so as I talk about it, please do not underestimate the importance and the prominence of something that seems to be so obvious and how strategic it is for us to bring what I would call kingdom kindness to the world today. Again, reminding you that today the world is a place where that is needed even more than ever before. Well, I just want to remind you that the context of this command is the Apostle Paul in the, in, in the book of Ephesians. We're, right now we're studying uh, in uh, we started out in the book of Acts in our Bible study, and, we're, and what Daryl is doing is he's branching off into different letters that the Apostle Paul wrote as he takes his missionary journey. And so we're studying the book of Galatians, which is Paul's answer to a problem. And Paul does this very effectively sometimes. He'll take a problem and then write a letter. Church, the, the letters to the church in Corinth do that. Galatians do that. But Ephesians is a little different because it really, there isn't any si single problem that you see Paul talking about. But there's all of this tremendous, eternal, rich wisdom that he's giving to the church in Ephesus. And the section we're in right now in chapter 4 is he's giving this broader view of Christian unity and Christian maturity. So it's in the context of all of that that Paul tells us to be kind to each other. And why do I offer that? Because when I talk about the kindness that God has called you and I to at an individual level, it is certainly will be, and we'll talk about it's a testimony, it's an expression to those outside of these four walls, but it is also very much a part of what it means for us to be part of a local body of Christ, and it's something that I think makes the, the local church a very, very unique thing. And so as we talk today about what it means to be kind, and I don't mean to divide us in terms of sheep and goats, but I'm talking about just the different ways kindness gets expressed, is it's expressed outside of the body of Christ, and it is absolutely and certainly also expressed inside the body of Christ. Well, again, because I don't want to oversimplify it, I want to, I want to think about kindness and the way we express kindness beyond this idea of just being nice, and you're probably starting to think about what kindness might look like, and, and I believe as we talk about it, there are actually three realms to kingdom kindness. There are three ways that kindness get expressed, three of them that are challenging, I think, in unique and different ways, and I'm assuming that as I talk about them, that they'll find application in your life a little differently, and you may even be able to look back and say, oh, that was what was going on in my heart at that time. That's what God was doing in me, or I'm assuming that sometime today as we talk about these three realms of kingdom kindness, that the Holy Spirit might awaken you and say, hey, that's an area that I need you to be praying about. That's an area I need you to begin to look at change and transformation in. So what is the first area of kingdom kindness? Well, I believe in those three areas, there are the first area is what we feel. And I'm careful about this because I believe one of the problems in the culture is now is everything that we do is based on exclusively how we feel. So I'm not talking about that, but I'm saying our feelings matter. And what I mean is our heart matters. It, it was very much a part of that salvation journey for me that this hard calloused heart that I had began to soften and it was what seemed to be at my time the way I was observing it seemed to be random acts of kindness there's nothing random about what was going on but these acts of kindness that began to soften my heart and began to change the way I felt and so pre-Jesus there was a piece of this 
But even today, there's an element of how I feel that goes on to dictate the other two realms of kindness that I have to be mindful of. Paul talks about this early in the same chapter, in chapter 4, as he's building up to this topic of Christian unity and Christian maturity. Earlier in verse 17, he says this, So I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord, that you may longer live as the Gentiles do. And in this case, he's using the Gentiles as a bad example. You might even say how the pagans do, right? In the futility of their thinking, they are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God, Because of the ignorance it is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. That was the condition of my heart before coming to Jesus. That before I could find and be affected by the kindness, my heart, my feelings had to be interrupted. It's true for me today in my walk with the Lord. As God calls me to to be an administer of kingdom kindness, that that needs to come from a genuine place. And I believe it counts if I'm faking it, right? <laughs> but, the, but the intent is that the kindness that God has called us to, uh, to express to others is just an outflow of who we've come to be. That in fact, we have already changed and it is a fruit of that change. How do I know that? Because in that letter that we're going to talk about in Bible study in chapter 5 of the book of Galatians, that Paul talks about the fruit in Galatians 5, 22, but the, 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is Love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such thing there is no law. What is Paul saying is that a submitted, surrendered life in the Spirit, where the Spirit is filling me and empowering me, that the product of that is change. Real, genuine change. And that I made a new creation as I've been born again, and, not but, But, and I change in the likeness to Christ because I'm called to be a disciple of his. And to be like Christ, what did we learn last week? Is to love one another. And so as we consider what kindness looks like, it isn't just that we're looking at Jesus and saying, oh, I want to mimic and model and try to act like him. I literally want to be more like him. At At the core of this kindness movement, is that I'm actually literally changed and transformed. Today, I hope that there's more genuine, authentic, heartfelt kindness in my heart than there would have been before I would have known Christ. And so, as we consider the realms of kindness, the first thing is how we feel. The second area where the rubber meets the road and I think becomes a little bit more identifiable, it's a little bit, at least a little bit more provable, is beyond what we feel, it's what we say what we say. Paul actually starts out this passage in verse 29 before he gives us the instruction to be kind to one another in verse 32. In verse 29 he says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Now I want to be careful and I want to make sure that we're talking about what, me, what Paul means by coming out of our mouth, that the, the world at that time was mostly illiterate. Very few people knew how to read and write. And so as Paul talked about, what he, about kindnesses and what we say, it was largely and almost exclusively be the words we're speaking. Today, I think if Paul was giving him this as instruction in the 21st century, he would say, do not let any wholesome talk come out of your mouth or your tweets or your Facebook post. That we communicate in many ways. The words we use matter. What we say expresses and becomes evidence to the Christ that's in us and the life we're living. And it becomes evidence to the very church that we claim to be part of. And so we just sang a beautiful song about the evidence of God's goodness. We see the evidence. that is that evidence exemplified in us? If we are accused of being kind, is there evidence to convict of us that in the things we say? And so, it's the, it's the part that I want to remind us of today, and I want to just be really practical. Go back and look at your social media feeds over the past couple of months, just as a, as a matter of just taking a data sample, your tweets or your Facebook or your Instagram, the things you've commented, the things you've liked or disliked, is it representative of a kingdom kindness? 
Are you modeling the person of Jesus in what you say, what you write, the things you express? Because I think there's a world out there that's living in a mean place and might even be mean to you and I that needs a true, genuine, authentic kindness shown to them. And that we do damage to the kingdom when we act like they do, that we express our disagreement and the division in the same way that the world does. And so, after we say the kingdom kindness starts with what we feel, it really isn't what we say. The writer of Proverbs, of course, I know many of you who have heard this, the tongue is the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. This thing, (laughs) it is powerful. So much about disunity and the local body of Christ is caused because of the things and the unkind things we say to each other. It is why you hear me say and, and frequent the topic of gossip and slander. I'm not trying to control your mind. I'm not trying to control or take away your free speech right. It's not about that. It's about unity in the body of Christ. And that some of us, and I put myself in this category because this is still something that bubbles up in me, it's the, it's the other side of the coin of discernment sometimes, have a negative spirit that we're just bent towards seeing what's wrong with the world first. And I believe that's okay at some level, especially from a leadership perspective, but the activities, the things we say ought to reflect the heart of Christ, that we are to be judged by the things we say to others, especially to those outside of the church, and that the unity inside the body of Christ starts with the kindness that Christ has shown to us being expressed in the relationships inside the body of Christ. So the first area is what we feel, the second area is what we say. The final area is what we do, what we feel, what we say, and what we do. I I like to say that that kindness is is love that grows legs, that that there's there's a movement, there's a tangibility to the things we say, but frankly, the things we do that gives evidence to the kindness that is put in us, that it is the activities of the local church that you can point to and say, there is a kind group of people. It's the activities of me and my relationship that say there is a kind person. That it's not good enough to just talk about being kind, but in fact, that we ought to be kind. (laughs) And one of the things I love about the, the local church and what I see in the heart of God from the words that he's given us in his word is that there's a special place to the activities of kindness for those that are poor and and those that are vulnerable. That for those that it may be easier to to not consider or to frankly dismiss or to judge and put outside of a circle of relationship, those are the very people that God has called the church, and if you're here part of the church, he's calling you to see that as a special opportunity for expressing kindness. It is why the ministries of Celebrate Recovery in Joshua's place are the very centering and anchoring part of who we are as a church. Because it's in those ministries that we have the opportunity to love the unlovable, to support those that come in with whatever guilt and shame and condemnation that a mean world puts on them and say, no, you can belong here. You can be part of this. And that there are tangible acts that we are doing to those that are struggling that express the kindness of God. That we become the very hands and feet of God in our expressions. It's why the writer of Proverbs talks about this very unique relationship when he says, Whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord and he'll reward them for what they've done. God is serious about the church, about his people being kind to the vulnerable. It's why Jesus in Matthew 25 here reinforces this as he's talking about the sheep and the goats. And in this, in this analogy, in this parable, he talks about the king that, said, that is rewarding those that, that fed him when he was hungry and gave him drink when he was thirsty, that came and visited him when he was in prison. And, and the sheep said, we didn't do that for you, king. In this case, would have been representative of Jesus. And he said, no, whatever you've done for the least of these you've done for me. And so today, as I'm calling us to the understanding of how we feel and what we say and what we do, I want you to know that there is a special provision for what the local church does for those that are poor, those that are hurting, 
those that are struggling, and it is the very center part of who we are as a church. So if those are the three things we do, I don't want to miss the opportunity here because I think Paul is so effective in his communication that he gives us a little bit extra here to help us guard, and that is in verse 31, which is literally the verse before the command to be kind, he tells us what not to do. In verse 31, he says, get rid of bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. I think what Paul recognizes in the human and spirit, that before we can get to the part to where we be kind, where we be compassionate, we've got to do a little internal work. We've got to look at ourselves. And we've got, to, we've got to look at those kingdom kindness blockers and take them seriously. And he lists out, I think, a pretty comprehensive list. Bitterness. Here's the reality. I, I think some of us that are listening to this message today are, are, have been impacted, and I would say even victims, of some very unkind people. And it's understandable that the unkindness that was expressed to you, which may be abusive or neglectful, that that, that might cause you to be in, in a place of defensiveness and judgment and hurt. And the way you control that is you hang on to that anger and rage. I, I just want to warn you that kindness is a risk. K- kindness is a choice. What Paul, I think, is preparing us for as he gives us this command is we got to deal with those things. It is what I'm praying for this morning as the Holy Spirit has prepared our hearts and will continue to work in us, not just today, this week, in our salvation experience, that he's not just calling us to kindness as an activity, but in preparing us to where we literally become kind as we deal with the things that stop us from being kind. And I think Paul does a pretty good job here of saying, to start there, you got to deal. And so I think what the reality of this is sometimes kindness starts with repentance. But today, the first action of kindness that you might have to offer is that you ask the Holy Spirit, you ask the Lord to forgive you. And, and I'm not saying, I want to be careful here, especially as we're talking about someone who has been victimized by kindness. I'm not blaming the victim here. What I'm saying is our attempt to hang on to that bitterness and rage and anger isn't going to get us where God is calling us to. We've got to take the risk. We've got to be vulnerable. We've got to make amends. We've got to deal with those things that stop us from being the kind of kind people that God calls us to. I think it's in that place that we really emphasize the unique nature of the body of Christ. That as we consider these kindness realms, these kingdom kindness that, that we understand that this isn't just about doing nice things the way that the Kiwanis do nice things. It's, it's not just about us feeling different like we would if we watched a good Oprah series again, right? But that, that there's something at the essence of what God has called us to be as individuals and collectively as a church that makes this experience different inside the local body of Christ, Because I think, I don't know about you guys, the only place I hear about about these acts of kindness as it relates to what it means to the Christian experience that we identify that so much of us moving to a place of kindness is the place where we talk about here on a regular basis that it involves sacrifice and surrender. It it involves suffering. We, we, We try to normalize that here. I believe as an elder here and someone who has is, who is committed himself to preaching the fullness of the scripture that I can't invite you into this relationship with Jesus and not inform you that it's going to cost you something. In the same way as we consider what it means for us to be kind to one another, it's not just about being kind to people that are kind to us. What did Jesus say in Matthew 5 after the Beatitudes? He's like, you know, Well, anybody can be nice to somebody that loves them. Even the pagans or the tax collectors do that. What was his command? Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. So lest any of you read the back of your bulletin and said, oh, I can take this week off. Kevin's talking about being nice. (laughs) I expect that most of us are going to leave here today knowing that this call to kindness, this call to one anothering in our kindness is really much a more costly experience. Here's the good news. 
I think for those of us who read the word, those of us who take the word in as an application, we, we don't have to look far to say, what is that kindness really going to look like? Because just after Paul gives us this one another in command, what is now what we know to be chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, he says this, follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love. Jesus Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. What, what does it mean? Well, it could mean a lot of things, but I think the specific thing I want us to exit here with today is that if you're struggling for motivation to be kind, because it's very easy to rightfully say that person doesn't deserve my kindness. That is not a kindness that's earned. I'm just to acknowledge that. That's why it's hard, right? But what I am saying to you If you're a follower of Jesus today, we only have to look at his example. And what did we see last week in his example? He washed everybody's feet before he commanded them, including Judas's. And the next day, he went on to offer himself voluntary as a living sacrifice. I know kindness is going to be tough, but I doubt that much of the kindness that you and I are going to have to express this week are going to require that of us. But I do believe it gives us evidence of the goodness I do believe it gives us a a reservoir of hope for us to see, wait a minute, he did it for me, and in the same way I can express it for them, them being in the local body of Christ and those for outside. And so today, before we remember what that cost is and in communion, I want to pray that that this this kingdom kindness becomes something that that that, that is so evident in who we are as a church that it does what God said, that this is how you'll know my disciples, right? John 17, I think John 15, that you love one another. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, thank you as always for your word. Lord, I, I never, I, I never want to drift too far from the understanding and the appreciation about how deeply your word impacts the truth of what you want to reveal to us today. So God, I first want to, I want to call us and I, I, want, I, want, to, I want the Holy Spirit to bring conviction and, 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 and to compel us to, to see your word as a, as a living truth that gives life to us this morning in every areas of our life, especially our relationships. And God, as we consider the truth of what your scriptures gave us this morning as we traveled from the Old Testament to the New Testament, God, I I pray that there would be a a movement of even deeper kindness, and frankly, in a group of people that are already known for their kindness. And God, that the kindness that that we express wouldn't be just something we made up, Lord, but it would be a very part of who we are, and that as we consider what kindness looks like in our life, and as we express it to those around us, Jesus, that we first acknowledge and see it in you, and God, that we worship for you because of it. Because, God, you are the giver of all good things. And that causes me to want to be kind in the same way you've been kind to me. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.